bleak, beautiful, and the scene of one of the most horrific crimes in British history. This speaks to a level of sadism and psychopathy rarely seen in the UK or indeed in the world. Power and sex were sort of intertwined in the process. So the power over life and death, taking the children from the street, committing the murders, and then celebrating sexually. But actually you feel that they've been born that way. It is an act of nature rather than nurture. Many have tried to unravel the mind of Ian Brady. Did you see how someone could come under his power? I mean, was he as clever as he meant about to I can be? see why people would fall, like, would fall under his spell. In 2017, a briefcase became part of a cat and mouse game of intrigue played by Ian Duncan Stewart, also known as Ian Brady. Is there information inside which could uncover a macabre 56-year-old secret? Only Brady knows the answer. Getting behind the mind of Ian Brady starts with this briefcase. This is the end point of his life, but in a lot of ways, it tells us about where this all began. Right before he dies, he leaves a briefcase to the care of his lawyers, and he leaves it with very strict instructions that it shouldn't be open. So in some ways, he's controlling what's going on from beyond the grave. The question mark, what's in that box? What's in these boxes? What's contained within the boxes? Ian Brady, what went on inside the mind of a serial killer? It's weird, it's silent. There's no birds twittering, it's just silent. Even though down below, it's a busy road. Up there, you hear nothing, you can't hear anything. It's barren, it's freezing, and it's somewhere where he found solace. It's somewhere that he felt, you know, he saw beauty in, and I guess this, this nothingness kind of maybe attests to what he, that, that kind of dearth of, of love for humanity. They had nothing in his soul for that, right? There was no sense of connection to the world. And, and this is one of those places where you feel, well, I guess, very disconnected to humanity. There's, you know, very little thrives here. Ian Brady spoke about events on Saddleworth more to few people during his years in jail. One was Jeremy Coyd, who was tasked with assessing Brady's mind. At one stage of the interview, he managed to provoke me. I felt to the, really to the boundaries of my professionalism. And that was really unusual, that actually he irritated me um, to a considerable degree. And also I felt a sense of, of personal dislike. Without a woman at his beck and call, Brady might not have become a serial killer. Myra Hindley described her role in murders to a prison counsellor. It was his job to dispatch the children. His ultimate aim was to kill and for her just to assist with that. The extent of Ian Brady's killing might never have been revealed, but for a raw recruit in the Lancashire Police who determinedly stayed out on the moor until he made a breakthrough discovery. His evidence in court was given just feet from where Brady and Hindley stood. I was in the witness box, and when you looked over, 
The thing that I saw was the, the photograph that always portrayed deep set staring eyes and they just stared, just stared at. There was no reaction to where they were. It meant nothing to them. Drawing on first-person testimonies from those who examined both Myra Hindley and Ian Brady, Linda Papadopoulos has been on a journey of exploration inside the mind of a serial killer. A journey which begins with analysis of his final murder on a cold October evening in 1965. I think one of the most telling pieces of evidence about his state of mind is what he does on the night before he's actually arrested for the murder of Edward Evans. Edward Evans was at a bar in a Manchester railway station, now an exhibition centre, when he was approached and asked to return to the home of a couple who lived nearby. Edward had been out looking for a late drink, so he agreed. The house he went to, which stood just to the left of this modern block, was later demolished. The couple that he had met were called Ian and Myra. They were going to kill Edward. It would not be their first murder, but it would be the first time they would invite others along to help. David and Maureen Smith, Myra's sister. Enlisting partners in crime that night was the idea of Ian Brady. So up until this point, he's enacting these fantasies and he's got Myra on his side and he's controlling her and he gets such an inflated sense of, of control over his surroundings, over people, over these fantasies that he decides, you know what? I've done this with Myra. I'm actually going to bring somebody else in. Brady asked David and Maureen if they would join them on their sexually charged fantasy of child snatching and murder. At the couple's home on Waterbrook Avenue, Gorton in Manchester, the man would witness Brady first beat Edward with an axe and then strangle him to death. Just think of that for a moment, the idea that he has such audacity, such self-importance that he thinks he can bring in somebody who has no idea what he's doing. Actually, it's Myra's brother-in-law. Sit there, allow this person to watch him horrifically murder a young 17-year-old man and then expect him to not say a word. The next day, Myra's brother-in-law told police what had happened. Grady was arrested and sometime later, police searched left luggage lockers. Inside one, a cache of evidence, including a tape recording. It was a suitcase that had been left in the left luggage at Manchester Railway Station. The left luggage ticket had been found down the spine of Myra Henley's Bible. When they got these suitcases, they opened them up. The contents was photographs, tapes, all sorts of things. And they realized that they were not just dealing with a murder. There was more involved, and it involved children, male and female. The recording was of the torture of 10-year-old Leslie Ann Downey. And you can hear the screams of this uh, child in, in horrific distress asking for a parent. I, mean, um, I kind of feel that it's one of those things that you read about and it almost contaminates your soul. The enormity of the sadism that went on, it, it's, I think for even seasoned professionals, it, it's, it's beyond words. This little girl um, was not only murdered and tortured and, and, and sexually assaulted, but um, her her ordeal was taped, was audio taped, so that um, Myra and, and Ian Brady would uh, continue listening to it and enjoying it. During the investigations that followed, detectives were to find more photographs of children and an exercise book with the name John Kilbride scrawled on it. It was not the first time they'd come across that name. They started making their inquiries and realised that Ashton Underline, they were looking for a wee boy, John Kilbride. A search was ordered of Saddleworth Moor. We went up with spades and bits of tools. 
to search, basically search for John Kilbride. So they were using these photographs that we'd had and we were spread across Saddleworth Moor. And uh, it had got to lunchtime and we'd got nowhere. No, nobody had seen anything that was of any relation that what we were looking for. So we decided we'd go to get something to eat further down the road. As light fell, the search was all but called off, but Bob Spires had a feeling that he should make one last sweep. As I'm coming down the hills, something draws my attention to, it was a hollow in the peat filled with water. Stuck out of this water, it looked like a piece of withered stick stuck straight up. It was not a stick. It was the arm of a decomposing body, not that of John Kilbride, but of Leslie Ann Downey. John's body would eventually be found not far away. What other secrets lay out on the moor? And what part does a locked briefcase left behind by Ian Brady in 2017 play in uncovering them? Ian Brady met Myra Hindley in an office in Manchester in 1963. It was to be a fateful coupling. I think trying to figure out what was going on with Ian Brady means also trying to figure out what was happening between him and Myra Hindley. This dynamic where he needed to control her and she needed to please him led to some of the most horrific murders in the history of the UK. It was Hindley who first called the relationship shots, but Brady needed her to fulfill his as yet unrevealed plan. This is not to say that she was a passive participant. And in fact, we glean a lot of information about Myra Hindley from the work that she carried out with counselor Joe Chapman. She told me that the attraction to Brady in, in the very beginning was his looks. His, his dress, he was, he was suited, he was uh, um, clean cut. The first thing that, that she noticed was his nails because they were well manicured. In Hindley's version of events, Brady was, even before the couple had exchanged conversation, playing mind games. He didn't respond to her at all, which was an interesting thing for her. Brady knew the more that he ignored her, the more that she'd be drawn in. And the big thing for her was there was someone that she wanted to, to have some response to and he wasn't giving any. I think that was quite powerful. Brady, an unwanted boy who never knew his father and was given up by his mother for foster care, was a child who tortured cats, beat up classmates at school, and by 13 was in court on charges of housebreaking. He spent time in Borstal, prison for juveniles before moving to Manchester. Hindley, by contrast, came from an orthodox working-class Gorton Catholic family and whose job as a clerical worker was fairly standard. She may have fallen quickly for the brooding Brady, but he maintained a strong, silent act, part of his calculation, perhaps. He was a very clever man. He was clever, you think, he came from ordinary background, self-taught, held a good job, clerk held a good position, well read. He grooms his new partner, deconstructing her beliefs and values in favor of his, as he began training her, modeling her, for what he described as the perfect robbery. You know, they were talking about the consequences and he was saying to her that we, we need to have no respect for authority whatsoever because nobody's gonna help us out of this situation. We're about to get ourselves in. So um, they both knew that they were working towards something that initially was gonna be the perfect robbery. That actually then turned out to the idea of a perfect murder. According to Hindley, Brady soon wanted to brutalize her, prepare her for the sight of blood. There come a point when Brady had decided that she had got to do something to see how far she could take her teachings. And one of those things that he suggested they do was she'd managed to get hold of guns because she joined the local gun club, which initially was to, to use 
on the robbery and going up onto the moors and, and taking shooting practice and stuff like that. But then there was the idea that she would kill an animal, a sheep. She told me that that filled her with horror. But one of the things she had to do was show him that she could cope with that process. So they drove up there. He got her to point the gun in the, the direction of the sheep. She didn't want to pull the trigger. And they shoot the sheep at point blank range so that she was looking into the animal's eyes and then the, to bury the, the carcass. What she told me about that was that throughout that process, Brady was very much in control of what was going to happen and very much the teacher with the student who was going to see how she developed the courage. All of his moves were so calculated. He very much was, you know, the star of his own show right from the beginning, right to the end. Having blooded Hindley, literally, Brady now had what he felt he needed to fulfill his fantasy. He wanted to carry out the perfect murder of an innocent. And now he had the perfect partner. One of the things about children as a victim for somebody who may have been strongly motivated by control, it's easy to control and fool and abduct children, particularly if you've got a female accomplice to do this with you, like uh, Myra Hindley. Pauline Reed goes missing in 1963. And with hindsight now, we know that this is where Ian Brady's killing begins. His planning of that was meticulous. They'd worked out roughly how it was going to happen. They didn't know who or even where in terms of where that, that child might be walking at the time. Pauline Reed lived near Myra Hindley. Myra often saw the teenager in Gorton, all to the good for Brady's first foray into murder. Myra Hindley pulled up alongside Pauline, saying that she had lost a glove on the moor. She asked Pauline if she could help find it. But once um, she had managed to get the child into the vehicle, then everything from then on was checked. Um, what she was wearing was itemised, how many buttons on her blouse, what was in the car. Notes would be kept on every single aspect of that abduction. Brady, on a motorcycle, followed Hindley in the car. On the moor, it's believed Pauline was told that Brady was Myra's boyfriend. He had also come to help find the glove. Within an hour of Pauline getting into Hindley's car, she was dead. Her throat had been cut twice with a large knife. The larger of these wounds was a four-inch incision across her voice box. She couldn't scream. Brady had conducted events. Brady had killed an innocent. What pleasure had he taken? There have been various sort of indications that sexual pleasure was gained from the killing of those children. There also would have been probably of equal pleasure to him was the actual control. Actually exerting, being cruel and in control of the victims. Hindley would later confirm to one investigator that Pauline had been sexually assaulted. She could tell the way that her clothes looked. The couple left the moor, returned to Gorton. And they went through the checklist at home. So he wanted to know that there'd been nothing left behind, that there would be no sense of the, that they'd been there. I think when we see these sort of pairings, these sort of psychopathic pairings, it's, it's easy to, to assume that, you know, one is much more active, another one's a pleaser. But I, I don't think it gets to the essence of what's happening in this case. I think absolutely Brady worked to desensitize Hindley. Uh, he, he absolutely did. He would show her videos of, of, of uh, horrors from World War II. He, you know, he'd actually get her to, to reenact um, the, the process of killing animals. What she said was, after the killing of Pauline Reed, that was the point when God ceased to exist was her words, when her world became enmeshed completely with his. She knew there was no going back. Even if she'd wanted to, they needed each other in order to stay safe. So they were bonded at that point. After killing her, Brady and Hindley returned to the neighborhood. 
As they drove, they passed mother Joan Reed, accompanied by her son Paul, as the family searched the streets for Pauline. The killers returned to their house, Brady pleased with his partner in crime. The thinking amongst the vast community of psychoanalysts who've investigated Ian Brady was that he was soon controlling Myra Hindley. If you were malleable and manipulated by him successfully, he would, things would be good for you. Some don't think it's that simple. I don't think he manipulated Myra. She obviously followed the same lines as him because I don't think anybody could be twisted enough. But she obviously had an inclination. In 2003, Professor Jeremy Coyd was tasked with assessing Brady's mental health. He is perhaps one of the best to judge the state of Brady's mind. I drove to see him in Ashworth in Liverpool. I think that what was most striking about him was actually to see this elderly gentleman um, he was thin, had a shock of grey hair, um, and he looked to be a bit like a very shabby Oxford Don. So he had a sports jacket and flannels. The Oxford Don lookalike staging what he called a hunger strike had not, it seemed, changed the attitude he had to authority and the one that he had instilled in Myra Hindley in 1965. He also had a tube up his nose from where he was uh, being force-fed, but that didn't actually stop him from appearing with a very large um, plastic mug of, of tea. Coyd had interviewed notorious criminals before and generally found a way of seeing them as worthy at least of the respect that he might offer anybody. With Brady, he had difficulties. With in Brady, it was totally different. And so it was extremely difficult for me to focus on what I needed to assess because he needed to maintain control. This was a man whose obsession with control was on the order and level of madness, of megalomania, which is not really in the psychiatric textbooks, but, but that is what he was Everything seemed to revolve around an obsession about being in control, being the master, and so everybody had to be subjugated to his will and to his control. According to Myra Hindley, she was being controlled by Brady in late November 1963 when they saw 12-year-old John Kilbride as they drove through a town called ashton under Lyne in what is now known as Greater Manchester. Hindley pulled up warned John that his parents would be worried that he was out so late. She offered him a lift home. Hindley also offered John the further inducement of a bottle of sherry, anything to get him into the car. Once inside, Brady revealed that they would have to go to their home to get the sherry. It was all pre-planned. Hindley would later claim that Brady had programmed her. She actually said that Brady was structured in what he did, and he structured in how he actually approached the relationship so that he was very clear about the process from start to finish in terms of the murders. And he was very good at getting her to um, remove any thoughts of the consequences afterwards, just concentrate on what you're doing and remove any thoughts of what the consequences might be afterwards. So she would be asked to, to push those thoughts as far back as she could in her mind and to just focus on whatever she was doing in the moment at that second. At that moment, she was driving a 12-year-old boy to Saddleworth Moor, where Hindley knew that Ian Brady had already killed. Brady and Hindley may or may not have gone to Wardlebrook Avenue for the sherry, but they did eventually head to Saddleworth Moor. Brady took John Kilbride outside. Hindley claims she waited in the car. Brady then sexually assaulted John and attempted to slit his throat with a six-inch serrated blade before fatally strangling him with a piece of string, possibly a shoelace. Saddleworth Moor has a magnetic attraction to some living nearby, like Cody Lackey. 
a former violent criminal and ex-convict himself. He's local and wanted to be a hero by unearthing the whereabouts of the body of one of Brady's victims. To win his confidence, Lackey became a pen pal, exchanging dozens of letters. Cody, you wrote to him. What did you make of Ian Brady? It's all obviously been very documented that he was very narcissistic and stuff, very self loathing and stuff. So I just sort of came at an angle from a criminal's perspective. Yeah. Um, and he sort of, I think he trusted me, well, he trusted me to an extent that um, I got to know him on a different basis that I think a lot of other people did. However, if Cody thought that he was going to get Brady to reveal secrets of what went on in the moor, he was wrong. It was Brady who began to control his new friend. He was quite a manipulative character to the point that, did he try and get you to kind of do things for him? Did he do that kind of reward punishment thing that he often did with the people close to him? How was he with you? Uh, when we started off, it was just like letters. And then as time went on, he began to trust me and stuff. We swapped DVDs. Yeah. Um, he'd asked for very, like, um, he sent me like, not tasks, but he wanted particular things like closed V envelopes yeah. and stuff, which I'd, I'd struggle to find because they're all peel and seals and stuff. And then I managed to locate some, I sent them in. Then he wanted uh, Schaefer pen refills, yeah. so I sent them in. DVDs he wants sending in and yeah. stuff. And um, yeah, it's just like, I had, I think I had, it's like he, he was challenging me sort of thing. Yeah, so yeah. I went above and beyond. I invested a lot of time and money and effort yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. in corresponding with him and stuff. But. Um, yeah, like I say, I got to know him on a different scale than I think other people. So do you think there was an arrogance to the man? Like, a lot of people have spoken about his narcissism, but there seems to be something more there. There seems to be something around him feeling better than. Did you find that kind of arrogance? Did you find any evidence of that? He looked down on people. He was quite a... He put himself on a pedestal, and I think he, he honestly believed he was, like, godlike. Yeah, I, I yeah. still see it, even in death. What do you think, because uh, very famously he out to his death, he leaves these two, um, two briefcases to his lawyer. Um, what do you think was contained within those? Was this just another ploy to kind of, you know, seem relevant, seem in control? I think it was something for his legacy to go on after, even in yeah. death. Okay. The, the question mark, what's in that box? What's in these boxes? What's contained within the boxes? And it keeps him relevant. So did you see how someone could come under his power? I mean, was he as persuasive as they made him out to be? Was he as clever as they made him out to be? I can be? see why people would fall, like, would fall under his spell as yeah. such and stuff like that, because, like I say, he was a manipulative person and yeah. stuff. He, he was quite demanding in what he wanted and stuff. He was always above people in, in any which way, whether, yeah. it was, whether it was as a criminal, whether it was in the, 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 the gangland fraternity and stuff. He always saw himself as above people. He, yeah. Like I say, he saw himself as, like, itself, as a, like a godlike figure, if you will. I think speaking to Cody, what we get is this insight of Brady, of those years where he was incarcerated, that kind of attest to this, not just narcissism, but kind of arrogance, this sense of being better than. You know, when Cody spoke about his tastes, whether they be in music or in shows, or even, you know, the, the way that things had to be a particular way, the stuff that he asked for. I think part of it was about these wild goose chases that made him feel better than, but the other part was trying to kind of set himself up as somebody, um, even within these circles that was better, was a pseudo-intellectual. And that very much feeds in to who he was from the beginning. So we do see a consistency within that character, but actually it seems to have continued and even been amplified in some ways as well. The third Moore's murder was of Leslie Ann Downey, picked up by Brady and Hindley at a fairground. It was her torment that police would one day hear, recorded on tape by her killers. Leslie Ann was on her own when they approached her. Hindley dropped some of the shopping she was carrying close by before asking for the girl's help to carry some of the packages to their car and then onto their home. Leslie Ann was never seen again. It was her body which had been accidentally found in 1963 by the young officer Bob Spires as he in turn searched for the body of John Kilbride. The minute detail of events that day still haunt him. So there's something there. I marked the spot with a stick, went back down to where the others were, loading the vans up, and I picked up one of these long metal rods that we had been using. The idea was you stuck these in the ground pulled it out and you sniffed it. 
If there was any decomposed body, in theory, you would smell it. So I went off on my own, went up back up to the spot, and again I prodded it around. I was determined, there's something here, but no idea. Spires was on top of the moor on his own as the search was winding down. He called down to his colleagues. We've got a body. It's not what we want. It's a female. It was Leslie Ann Downey. The photographs subsequently discovered revealed that she had been gagged, forced to pose for photographs before being sexually assaulted and killed. She was buried, naked with her clothes at her feet, in a shallow grave. After his death, Ian Brady's body became the centre of a debate and dispute. He had asked for his cremated remains to be scattered at sea. Campaigners wished for his remains to be buried deep in a hole in the grounds of a prison to be forever forgotten. It was a debate Brady may well have smiled at ruefully if he had been alive, and it speaks much to how his mind works. He has an agenda of his own, um, and he wishes to maintain control. That desire for control meant that the truth about events on the moor was only fitfully revealed by Brady and Hindley. They made two families wait 22 years before revealing what they had done, and they never gave up another secret, the whereabouts of their fourth victim, a boy called Keith Bennett. Is the truth of where his body lies, locked away inside the case, left behind by Ian Brady? Brady and his partner made the families of some victims wait 24 years before admitting the truth of how they had killed. Drip-feeding information was all that Brady could do to remain the centre of attention. They're paying him attention, and that's wonderful for him, because much of what he needs to do is main, can maintain control of these people to constantly get attention and constantly be the central focus. It was not until 1985, first Hindley, then Brady revealed what they had done to Pauline Reed. Unusually, Hindley had driven the release of information. And I, I got this sense that, that the person that I was meeting wanted, desperately wanted, to get some sort of idea as to how and why uh, she managed to get herself into the position she did with Ian Brady. Um, but it soon became clear to me over, over a few months, actually, that those answers were there. She, she, she knew, I just think, she, she wanted to verbalise it. She'd only previously spoken to the um, prison Catholic priest, and uh, this was a sort of extension of that, that process, really. The body of the couple's third victim, Keith Bennett, has never been found and the whereabouts of his remains became an object of the cat and mouse game played by Ian Brady. He reportedly says he, he can't remember, he thought it was here, he thought it was there, but you could seriously see somebody with that level of psychopathy standing on top of where this young boy was buried and just saying, do you know what? Can't remember where he is. The couple did eventually confess to Keith Bennett's murder. The 12-year-old Keith Bennett had vanished on his way to his grandmother's house in Longsight, Manchester, early in the evening of the 16th of June, 1964, four days after his birthday. Hindley lured him into her mini pickup, which Brady was sitting in the back of, by asking for the boy's help in loading some boxes, after which she said she'd drive him home. Instead, she drove to a lay-by on Saddlemouth Moor, as she and Brady had previously arranged. Then Brady went off with Bennett, supposedly looking for a lost glove. She told me that he'd introduced in the early stages the idea of, of being able to control the subconscious, of being able to do something without any consequence whatsoever to yourself. And the only way you could do that is by, if, you, if you're going to be doing harm against another person, you've got to dehumanise that person. You've got to split from the emotion. You can't have a conscience about what you're going to do, otherwise that's going to get in the way. Hindley kept watch, and after about 30 minutes or so, Brady reappeared, alone and carrying a spade that he'd hidden there earlier. 
When Hindley asked how he had killed Bennett, Bailey said that he had sexually assaulted the boy and strangled him with a piece of string. Manchester police would uncover a macabre photograph. It's the one of uh, Myra Hindley kneeling down, looking at the grave which turned out to be the grave of John Kilbride. For psychological investigators, the photograph was taken as part of a chilling triumph. It is quite clear that the, the photographs, Myra Hindley sitting on, the, the, on, on top of her victim, basically, who's buried secretly, is a way of getting enormous excitement and one-upmanship. This is a man who loves control, he loves conning people, he loves manipulating people, he loves to feel better than other people. And what better way to f feel better than everybody, including the police, but have a, um, a photograph. The whereabouts on the moor of the body of Keith Bennett has remained secret, a secret kept by Ian Brady. Although he agreed to help police search, the search proved fruitless. If I could have found out anything from my talks with Maya and my contact with her about where Keith Bennett's body was, then I would have wanted to have done that in any way possible. Um, when we talked about it, she was of a belief that Brady was the only one who could pinpoint roughly where that body was. I asked if it was, if it was possible that he'd have gone up there knowing where the body was, literally standing on the grave and saying to the police, no, I've no idea. And she said, yeah, that's possible, because that is part of the game as well. It's cat and mouse, it's the only body that was left, but certainly this one was, was the one that everybody was excited about, and therefore, given what we already know about Brady, why would he want to reveal its whereabouts? Given what we already know about him, and I think Myra believed that he had no intention of helping. The couple stood trial in 1965. There in court, Bob Spires. You were looking into the face of evil with both of them. There was no remorse. They just blank look. They looked at one another. It was as if it was a joke. The seriousness didn't matter to them. It didn't, didn't seem to bother them. And it was these deep set staring eyes. And I thought, what? Well, that's how I've seen them at the first part of the trial. Those are like the photographs that are in the papers. And that's how two people looking with deep set staring eyes. Convicted and jailed for life, Brady and Hindley avoided the death penalty by just a few months. It had only recently been abolished. Their court case became an iconic 60s image. They were just mobbed because the feeling of the general public is uh, members of the family and relatives, all the rest of it. If they had got their hands on Brady and Hindley, there would be no court case. Family members had said to the media, we get them, they're dead. We will do them. I don't care what you do, we will do them. And that was the feeling. So as we went, we had to sort of battle our way through the crowds. There were still mysteries, and one in particular allowed Brady to keep up his control freakery. Where are the remains of Keith Bennett? Countless searches have taken place. Both Hindley and Brady agreed to return to help point out where they had buried him, but somehow couldn't find the body. I believe from what she said to me that he was going to control right up to his death, and that not being able to find Keith Bennett's body somehow vindicated everything that he'd, he'd talked about and to others and, and uh, the bit about having won. I've been asked many times by the different media people, do you think young Bennett will ever be found? And I don't think he will. The winning is, is the fact that, yes, I, I've, I've been convicted and found guilty of, of all these murders, but they haven't got all the bodies. Why? Why did Brady do what he did? What had gone on inside his mind? For the man tasked with assessing his state of mind, there is a clear diagnosis. 
I think this speaks to a level of sadism and psychopathy rarely seen in the UK or indeed in the world. He had a severe psychopathic personality, that was his major diagnosis, and that his offences primarily related to uh, a, a third diagnosis, which was sexual sadism. A sadism that perhaps has lasted to present day. What is in the briefcase that he has given to his solicitor with instructions for it never to be opened? There are so many potential games, aren't there, in, in, in that briefcase. So, of course, there's a huge temptation, particularly if you're, you are um, law enforcement and indeed a, a nosy psychiatrist. What's in it? Is there any way I can get into that briefcase to see what's in it? But for all you know, that could be a whole series of blank pages with nothing whatsoever of importance. Um, and it wouldn't surprise me if there was nothing of great value in terms of understanding whatsoever. The main thing was it exists, it's out there, and it's there to torment, to tempt, manipulate everybody involved with him. I think he knew the location of Keith's body, but I think within the briefcases and stuff, I don't think there's anything there of significant importance. Probably personal items that were personal to him. I don't. I read about a manuscript and stuff and all these sort of things, but I don't really buy into that, to be honest. This is something which I think he has left to continue tormenting the public, the media, law enforcement, the legal system, psychiatrists, after his death. The games will continue, the control will continue, even after I'm gone. <laughs>